members. Now help me welcome our first speaker, George. Hi guys, my name is George and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, I had no idea what I was going to say. Absolutely none. So, somebody's motioning me for... Is that better? Oh, well, see? Then you were all lying to me when you said that... Uh, Okay, that's only eight minutes I have to go then. <laughs> so uh, I don't have much of a drunk log. I drank by myself 90% of the time. Once in a great while, I'd go out to a bar, but it was always cheaper to drink at home. So I drank at home. Um, I remember the, f the very first time that I had any alcohol whatsoever, I was... Uh, about four years old, and uh, my dad had a party, and everybody was drinking beer, and I would go around, and whatever beer was left over in the empty bottles, I'd pour it into a glass, and I threw some ice cream in it and had a beer float. <laughs> I can't believe that after all of this time, I can still remember that. The next time I drank, I had stolen a bottle of vodka from the local thrifty's drug store. And uh, that, when, that was on a Monday, that, that Friday night, I poured about half of it into a tall uh, cup, added some uh, orange drink to it, and I don't remember how much of it that I drank, but I drank enough to pass out. So I, I remember a few things during that, uh, that evening, but... One of them is going to a drive-in, and I remember there were some girls involved. Uh, I remember them trying to get coffee into me, and the next thing I remember is waking up in jail. What, consequently, I found out that the, the guys got tired of me, threw me on my front lawn, and uh, the cops came by and said, oh, there's a body on the lawn, and hauled me off to jail. So that was the first real drunk that I had. And wouldn't you know it, the very next week I wanted to do it again. So uh, I, uh, I don't remember, well, kind of an oxymoron, but there's only one time that I was told that uh, I had a blackout. And that was during my teen years also. Um, and uh, other than that, I just drank by myself. I never fit in anywhere. You know, that, that's one of the things that uh, I found true for myself. I never fit in anywhere. I was always the last person to be uh, picked for the baseball team or the soccer team or whatever. And uh, the th thing of it is, is that this was back in the early 50s. I'm half German, half Russian. That was not a good mix right after the war. So, you know, I was somewhat ostracized, and that's the way I kind of grew up, uh, being a loner. And uh, I, the years went on. I did this, that, and the other. Went to school and dropped out, and went to school and dropped out. And I could never finish much of anything. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I Finally, on my 26th birthday, I was a smoker, three-pack a day smoker. On my 26th birthday, I had a nervous breakdown, what I consider a nervous breakdown. And uh, I quit drinking for a while, and I quit cigarettes, too. It's the hardest dang thing I ever did in my life. It was harder to quit cigarettes than it was to quit alcohol. And uh, I remember seeing... Uh, the next morning, I, w I went to uh, the junior college I was attending, and uh, I was sitting on the quad. The bell had rang. Every everybody went off to their classes, and there was this guy on crutches walking 
to his classroom. And I thought to myself, you know, you sorry son of a bitch. You got your nerve being, feeling sorry for yourself. And that guy's got a whole lot worse condition than you are. And he's making it to class and you can't. And for whatever reason, I started in earnest to go to school. I made straight A's for uh, the next year and a half and graduated uh, with an AA degree in uh, accounting. But uh, after that, I started working again and I started uh, drinking some more. And it was just a, years went by, years went by. Nothing eventful happened to me. Uh, I just remember bits and pieces of being drunk. Uh, and uh, virtually uh, nothing eventful happened. So there was a, a time when I, when I decided to do something about this. And what it was is that uh, I was involved with a gal and she had a friend that was going to adult children of alcoholics. Now, I had no idea about alcoholism uh, or any of that stuff. Uh, but when she told me about adult children of alcoholics, I knew, I knew that I drank inordinately too much. I mean, I wasn't buying pints or half pints. I was buying one and three quarter liter bottles and I was drinking that. And uh, so I knew I had a problem with alcohol, but I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I didn't even know what alcohol or alcoholism was about. And uh, I finally uh, hit that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization that the big book talks about. And I had a 10-day Coke run, and I, well, don't get me wrong, I, I did uh, any kind of drug that happened to be by, but I always started with alcohol, and I always finished with alcohol. Alcohol was the love of my life. And uh, I wound up... Uh, Feeling that, that after a 10-day coke run, I, I, I was beside myself. I, I had to do something, and I didn't know what. And fortunately, at one of the, uh, at this uh, ACA uh, meeting that I was attending to, uh, a gal told me about a counselor that could help me. And I made an appointment and wound up uh, seeing her. And she said, sure, there's, I can help you. And I thought, thank God. And she said, well, there's only... Two things you have to do, though. And I said, I'm anything. She said, first, find an AA meeting for every day of the week that you drank. Well, that was every day of the week. And then she said, don't drink between meetings. And I thought, I, what? But that willingness, I had that willingness because to this day, I remember how bad I felt. Excuse me. And uh, because of that willingness, I, I started attending meetings. And the thing of it is, is that when you're a loner, like I was, you didn't do too much social interacting with, with people and whatnot. Uh, and the truth of it is, is that uh, I was too scared. Uh, I was too scared to interact with people. And uh, I wound up going to these meetings and listening more than I, I could talk. There was one round robin uh, meeting that I went to and I knew I'd have to speak because when it came around to my turn, I'd have to say something. But uh, other than that, I, you know, I didn't have much of anything to say. But the thing of it is, is that I found out that I was a lot like you guys. You know, I had similar experiences. I felt similarly about this, that, and the other that you did. And through your sharing, I was able to admit to my innermost self that, yeah, George, you're an alcoholic. And things started to change at that point. I, uh, I didn't get involved in, in the program right away. It took me a little while to find a sponsor. But the, my home group was a men's stag. And this was one of the rowdiest groups I've ever, even to this day, I've ever encountered. Uh, they're irrelevant, irreverent, not irrelevant, irreverent, and uh, they, did, well, you had to have thick skin to survive there, let's put it that way. And uh, I wound up finding a sponsor there, and it was a, a, a fella, a few years more sober than I was. I was in the trades, I was in construction, 
and, and he was a painting contractor, and uh, he's still kind of my sponsor. I still talk to him on a regular basis. One of the things that uh, I found was that in this group of men at this men's stag, there was a, a, a bunch of us that were in the trades, and I started relating with these people, and we started doing things. And I never knew that I could have fun without alcohol. And they taught me everything. I learned that I could go camping without alcohol. I can go river rafting without alcohol. I can have go attend parties without alcohol, barbecues, you name it. And I learned how to do all of that in Alcoholics Anonymous. With the help of these guys, you know, not all of them survived. Uh, this one fella, I, God, he breaks my heart. Uh, they found him with a needle in his arm. And all it takes is that one time, and that, that's all they wrote. And his son and my son used to play together. I went to meetings with my son all the time. And he, well, he's a well-behaved kid. And uh, they, they played outside the meeting hall. And uh, it just broke my heart when I heard about him. Um, what else? So uh, I continued to attend many. You know, people, they read the AA literature. They pray. They uh, do all kinds of things to get in con conscious contact with a power greater than themselves. I never knew how to do any of that stuff. But what I did do, and, it, and it's probably the only thing that I've done right in Alcoholics Anonymous, is that I kept going to those same meetings over and over and over. And in early sobriety, they told me uh, to be of service. And I wound up getting uh, little commitments to do this, making the coffee. They wouldn't let me touch the cookies for a while because they didn't trust me. But uh, I, I, eventually I wound up with that. And one of my first jobs was cleaning ashtrays. Jesus. The club that, I, that we went to, it's called Thursdays on PCH in Sunset Beach. And it was a small venue. It was, well, from, from that bandstand to the end of this room and not much wider. And they had the bright idea when, when smoking was still uh, okay. All the smokers were on this side of the room. The non-smokers were on that side of the room. And the cloud of smoke was down over, just over your head. And uh, yeah, I got to tell you, there's no zealot like a convert. And when I quit smoking at 26, and then now I, I'm fast forward to 35 when I got sober, I couldn't stand cigarettes. And having me clean ashtrays for those sons of bitches that are smoking, I could not believe I, well, anyway, willingness was the key. I was willing to do whatever anybody said. And I am just thankful for that because to this day, you know, I am willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober. My favorite steps are the sixth and seventh because those are the discovery steps for me. That's where I interact with God. And uh, I never believed in God. I didn't even like to use the term God, but... Uh, being a good, lazy son of a gun, uh, it, using the term God is a lot easier than my higher power. So I, I, I use the term God all the time now. And uh, I say two prayers a day. And they're really short because I don't have a pipeline to my God. And uh, at night when I go to bed, uh, I, say, I thank him for another day and uh, go over my day and see if I owe an amends to anybody. And it's been a long time since I've had to apologize to somebody. Now, uh, it used to be a different story. And in the morning, when I wake up, I, say, I, I thank him for another wake up. And I ask him, what will you have me be today? And I immediately follow that by, 
please don't make me a bad example. Because in paraphrasing the, the seventh step prayer, take away those things to st that stand in the way of my usefulness to you. And uh, I just pray that I'm not, you know, God needs bad examples as much as he needs good examples. I just didn't want to be one of the bad ones. Now, one quick aside. I don't particularly care for driving. I want to get from point A to point B. And when somebody slows me down or, you know, I used to drive around with a finger out the window and uh, it was pointed out to me, George, you have a little AA symbol on the back of your car. <laughs> and I, yeah, is this the example you want to set for all of those people out there? And uh, so I kept my windows rolled up. <laughs> well, the, the hand still went up, but the, the window it kept me from going out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, the thing of it is, is that in doing the sixth and seventh step, I wound up finding out that, yeah, I'm just like the guys that I complain about that are driving in front of me. And uh, I got, God has taught me patience and He's taught me a lot of stuff. I, I mean, but patience is one of those things that I'm really grateful for because uh, it has a way of uh, making my life better. Gratitude and, uh, yeah, I got a lot of gratitude in my life and I've got a lot of thankfulness too. And that's it for me. Thanks. Wow. Okay, now, please give our main speaker a big hand, Chuck. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Chuck. I'm an alcoholic. My, uh, God, I'm already who's <laughs> Uh, my sobriety dates February 19th, 1978. That's 16,635 days. I looked it up. That's a long time to not have a drink when you drank like I did. Because I was a daily drinker when I after I started drinking. You know, I want to also welcome the uh, newcomers who are here, Dan and Mike, and I can't remember the other name because I'm so wrapped up in myself. Uh... <laughs> You know, matter of fact, it was so long ago when I got here, I was skinny and had hair, you know, and that's kind of how, that's kind of how it goes, guys. I, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about drinking because we all know how to do that, but I'm going to get back, back to a little bit other stuff. Uh, I was born in Oklahoma and I was six to seven kids lived on a farm in Oklahoma. Uh, my, uh, well, that was later on. But when I was born, uh, my mom left me in the hospital till I was six months old because she already had five kids at home. And they had to call her and say, come get this kid. You know, and I was kind of treated like her. From the time I was two to six, I was raised by my uh, great aunt of mine, who was a full-blood Osage Indian. And, and I'm uh, one-quarter Osage Indian. And uh, did you know the Indians were the only group of people in the world that never invented alcohol? So we haven't learned to assimilate alcohol that well, uh, but we did have peyote, which was which was which was a lot of fun. I uh, I don't know why I chose that family. Some people say that we do choose them, and I kind of believe that. But we're supposed to learn lessons. My father was a disabled vet from World War II, as a paraplegic. I always saw him in a wheelchair or on crutches. And he was, a, he was a very resentful man. He didn't like, he was hurt when he was in his 20s. My mother was a half Osage Indian and had, was uh, totally committed to my dad. Even though they were married for 48 years, they shouldn't have been married for 48 minutes. There was a lot of violence in our household when I was a kid. I actually remember one evening, we never had friends over hardly or anything, but one night we had cousins over. And we were sleeping out in a screened-in porch in Oklahoma. 
And uh, my parents were in a big fight. I'm trying to go to sleep because I'm used to it. My cousin is shaking. I mean, he was so scared. And they're talking about getting divorced. And he says, who are you going to go with if they get divorced? And I said, they're not getting divorced. Just go to sleep. I was so used to it that I was anesthetized by it. You know, and it's amazing how a little kid, I was probably seven or eight years old at the time, could do that. I saw so much abuse and alcohol and, and, and that when I was a kid that I was never going to grow up and be like that. I didn't take my first drink till I was 17 years old, which basically is a late starter for us alcoholics from what I understand. I don't know, but one day my sister and I was down with her future husband in Baja, California. I don't even know why we went down there. And down at Rosarita Beach, down in Baja, I can remember this vividly today. For some reason, we went into this hotel and they had a bar and we sent in and my brother-in-law says, do you want a drink? And I was 17, I was out of high school by that time already. I was a very good student actually. And uh, I said, sure, he says, what do you want? And the only name of a drink I knew was a screwdriver. I said, I'll have a screwdriver. I sat on that bar and I remember looking out this picture window and saw the ocean there and waves coming in. It was a nice warm day. And God, for about 30 seconds, I felt so wonderful. It was the most fantastic feeling I'd ever had in my life at that time. But uh, I spent another 11 years chasing that 30 seconds that I felt that day. I was, I was there, and I took that drink that day, and by that afternoon... I was in Tijuana, I'd lost my shirt, one of my shoes, and I was trying to direct traffic on a street corner. That was, that was the start of my drink, and I threw up in the back of my sister's car, which I really caught hell for later on, and I thought, this is terrible, I'm never gonna be like that again. About two weeks later, it started over again. Now, I didn't drink very much, actually, until I was like 21 years old, and I discovered bars. I love the hell out of bars, and the divier, the better, it seems. I used to get in, into a lot, of, uh, a lot of bar fights, if you can believe that, of a nice, quiet guy like me. And, and, I, and I don't know why. I wouldn't even be talking to these guys, and they would come over and start beating on me because I'd be over in the corner talking to their wife. You know? Alcohol made me very pretty. You know? I... Uh, I want to welcome, I, I welcome the newcomers, but you guys are in for a hell of a ride if you stick around here. You know, this is, is, is a really a we program. I looked this up on the internet. The word we in the big book is used 1,157 times. Can you believe it? It's on the internet. It's got to be true. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, well, maybe one or two more stories. I had a buddy of mine. After this was after I turned 21. A lot of my, I got married at 19, by the way. But it, you know, it was a starter wife, and uh, we had a couple. We had a couple of kids, and I loved those kids dearly. Two girls, two girls and a boy. And uh, I'll talk. I'll get I'll talked about them a little bit later. But uh, I start. I started drinking, and, and, and the woman couldn't control me. I mean, if I wanted to drink, I was going to drink, and that's the way it was, and I loved bars. I spent many, many nights away from home, away from my kids. I had become just like my dad, you know, except for the me. I never never spanked my kids or hit my kids, as, as opposed to what it was, you know, when I was growing up. But they, uh, uh, they sure deserved it a couple of times, but I didn't do it. But my uh, wife, she... Uh, uh, really did not like my drinking, neither. I told her I was a social drinker, you know. And what's a social drinker when you're an alcoholic? It's every, funny, every time somebody says, I think I have a drink, I say, well, social I, you know, and that was social drinking for me. I loved, I loved bars. And uh, uh, it got me in a lot of trouble, as I said. One night, uh, one, one buddy of mine, he was a Hispanic fella, Named Nick, we were out bar hopping. This was my first exposure to AA. 
We were out bar hopping. And as I said, he was Hispanic. We saw this bar, what we thought was a bar. We thought it said Alamo Club. It said Alano Club. We went in there. They tried to recruit us. We declined. But that wasn't my first exposure. Like I said, I started when I was 17. My first exposure to AA was when I was 21 years old. My first real exposure. I was working at a guy's house. I was a telephone man for Bell Telephone. And uh, went to his house and I knocked on the door and, and he came to the door. He said, I'm sorry, I was out play late. And I said, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, anyhow, we started talking. And he was a member of AA. And he gave me his phone number. And that night, for some reason, I went home and I saw the wife and I said, met this guy today and he said he's in AA. And he gave me his phone number and my wife says, you better hang on to it. Well, anyhow, about a few days later, I, I give this guy a call, and he, uh, I'm trying to hurry because I found out I didn't have quite as much time as what I really thought I did, but I'm going to get through this if I can and carry all, get all the highlights. But uh, I, uh, where was I? Well, his name was Bill, and I called him, and he came and got me, and I went to an AA meeting. It was a speaker's meeting in Carlsbad, California, and uh the uh, speaker was there, and, and I remember somebody telling me, well, give it 30 days. At the end of 30 days, if you don't like it, we'll refund your misery to you. Well, I stayed sober for 30 days at that time. And on the 31st day, I went home to the wife, and I said, see, I didn't have withdrawals. I didn't have DTs. I didn't, none of that stuff. And on the 31st day, I got drunk as, as I could. And it went on for another, another several years. There was a lot of, uh, as I said, uh, a lot of bar fights, a lot of fighting, a lot of drinking, and uh, uh, carousing. As I said, alcohol made me very pretty, and I let the women know it, you know, that I was a very handsome man, and they were missing out, but they didn't seem to care. But I, uh, geez, I, I, this is not at all how I had this thing planned. <laughs> I am an alcoholic. I am a recovering member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is one of the proudest things that I'm ever going to say in my life. I so much enjoy that. You know, alcoholics are just, uh, you know, inventive, uh, complex people. We're very complex. You don't think we're complex? Look at tradition, too. The original version had 22 words in it. After Alcoholics Anonymous got hold of it, revised it, it's now 32 words. That's the shortened version. That's how we do these things. We can complicate anything, it seems. Anyhow, uh, I was sober. I was sober for those 30 days, and then, and then I started drinking again. And it was like I was making up for lost time, too. I was a young 21 years old at this time. I started going back out. I was doing the bars. Shortly thereafter, I got arrested for my first DUI and uh, did not enjoy it. It went to San Diego County Jail. I remember, I remember being there and the doors slamming and it did not feel good. About a week after that, I got arrested for assault and battery after I got bailed, up, bailed out. My mother came down and bailed me out on my first DUI. On the way home, we went bar hopping. That's, you know, that's the kind of mom that I had. They, they drank so much. And whenever she got away from my dad, she always would take off drinking. And sometimes she would be gone for days and we wouldn't know what, what or where she was. And he would take it out on his kids, basically. Uh, I have, uh, I was, I've been married four times. I have a sister that's been married four times. I have a brother that's been married four times. I have two sisters that have been married two times. And one brother had never been married. No, I think we didn't learn how to relate to other people as a kid. I think that we had a little bit of problem in there, learning how to how to cope with people. I after after my mother and I did that, I I, I kept drinking, and I I don't know why. And it, and as I said, I'd been exposed to AA before, and they'd told me about it, you know, so I knew what AA was. Make a long story short, I drank for another uh, several years. Uh, in 1977, the summer of 1977, 
I, uh, my wife was going to leave me, and she'd found a boyfriend. And I was like, okay, good, go ahead. But then when it came down to push comes down to shove, I didn't care for that, you know. And the next thing you know, I got this guy, and I got hold of him, and I started beating the crap out of him. If I hadn't got pulled off of him, it's the only time in my life I think I would have killed somebody. I broke three of his ribs, broke his arm and his collarbone before he got away. I promised my wife at that time that I would quit drinking. I went on an abuse. This is the summer of 77. So for about six or seven months, I was on this anabuse until I decided that I could drink again and I was going to start weaning myself off. I uh, stayed off it for like two or three weeks, something like that. By the way, my, my behavior never changed. I kept going to bars during this time, shooting pool, talking to people, this kind of stuff that I do. Not as much as what I'd done before, but I, I didn't change my, my lifestyle patterns. And I kept doing the same old thing, expecting different results. But anyhow, when I went off to Anabuse, one day I walked in, I ordered that beer, and it all started up all over again. A week after I started drinking, I got arrested for assault and battery. A week to the day after that, I got arrested for my second DUI. And a week to the day after that, I was riding my motorcycle. I remember leaving the bar, and I remember waking up in a hospital. That's like the only blackout I ever remember having. I don't know, don't know what happened totally. But, the, but they put me in the hospital that night, kept me overnight. They let me out the next day. A friend of mine picked me up, and I went back to check on the motorcycle before I went home. I had crashed across the street from the North County Alano Club in Oceanside, California, that's when it hit me, as clear as I had my moment of clarity was, drinking is my problem, you know. I needed to get sober. I went, I went into that club that day. The lady was in there, was named Katie F. She had uh, come in early because she hadn't done her cleanup work from the night before. The doors wouldn't even have been open. God was working in my life at that time. God had worked in my life all along, but I didn't know it. He was saving me for something, but I had to have some experience, I guess, in my mind, because I wasn't convinced that I was an alcoholic before. But having been exposed to AA when I was 21, at 28, I came in. Oh, oh one more thing. The night, the night before when I was in a hospital, I said to the doctor, I said, I wouldn't even hurt that bad, but I said, just let me die. Everything would be, everybody would be better off if you just let me die. I wasn't even hurt that bad. I was 28 years old and I was ready to go. Things were so miserable and so terrible that I, that I was ready to go. And uh, it's amazing to me that I came out of that. I uh, was told 90 meetings in 90, this time I guess they stretched it out for a reason. They said 90 meetings were in 90 days. I wasn't sure I was going to make it to 90 minutes to the end of that meeting. It was a Sunday morning, 10 o'clock meeting. And like George was talking about, there was smoke everywhere, all this stuff. I was a smoker, but that didn't bother me. But I came walking in there. I was covered with mud and blood and had stitches on one side of my head. And I just knew that they needed me, you know. And as George was talking about a bad example, I was a bad example or maybe I was a good example of what would happen if you kept drinking, you know. I can guarantee you that things are getting worse the more that you drink and the longer that you drink. Being an alcoholic doesn't mean that you can't drink a lot. It, you know, being an alcoholic, it's not what you drink or how much you drink or how long you drink. It's what alcohol does to you when you do drink. And that's what it did to me. It made me a complete asshole. You know, there used to be a bumper sticker, I think, Instant asshole, just add it, just add alcohol, and that's that's what I was. I uh, don't really know if I ever enjoyed the taste of alcohol. I drank for the effect of alcohol. You know, the book talks about controlling and enjoying your drink, and whatever I enjoyed it, I didn't, you know, didn't control it. When I tried to control it, I didn't enjoy it. I always wanted more. Everything in my life was more. 
So I was sober for about two years. I decided to start my own business. Uh, my, my wife wasn't that fond of that. I uh, ended up divorcing her through that, but I couldn't divorce her until I found another one. You know, so then I had my rebound wife. So I've got my starter wife, my rebound wife, and that, my divorce between my first wife and my second wife was one year to the day apart, you know? And that's, that's, I guess it's what term a quickie? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, then I was alone. I went, I, after my business failed, I went to Alaska. I had my sister lived up there. She told me if I went up there, I could find this particular job working for the telephone company there. And I went up there and I was unemployed for about six months, almost starved to death. Was there for about four months, got in a big fight with my sister, got kicked out. So there I am, I'm homeless in Alaska. It's not a good place to be homeless, but it was summertime, I'll give you that. I was living in my car with everything that I owned at four years sober. I left Oceanside on my fourth birthday. Living in, living in Alaska, finally got this job, finally started to get back on my feet. And uh, my first wife calls me and said, I'm sending you our oldest daughter. She was a, uh, a prob kind of a problem child. She's still a problem adult, but she keeps going. What can I say? But that young lady, uh, she and I lived together for like four years, I think it was, before I met number three. You know, along came number three. I knew this gal. I met her. She was an AA member. I, I, I met her, and it was uh, five weeks and two days later we got married. I can tell you, not a good idea, you know. It did not quite work out. It was, you know, if you were alone and miserable, the only thing worse is being married and miserable. I can tell you that. That lady, though, we were married for two and a half years, and she was quite the learning lesson. I learned so much from that relationship. When it was over, though, I was so devastated. One night, I was sitting on the edge of my bed with a loaded pistol in my, in my lap, getting ready to blow my brains out, and I couldn't quite figure out why. And I was wondering, who's going to find the body, and who's going to clean it up? And that's kind of what stopped me, other than I got mad at God. I started hollering and going, I'm eight, I'm eight, nine years sober at this point. And, uh, and I'm still screwing up. But I got so mad at God that I started screaming, why do you do this to me? In the long run, looking back on it, he didn't do it to me, he did it for me. Because I learned a lesson. Shortly thereafter, I met this guy on the job and I said to him, I want you people to listen to this if you have a relationship. I don't know if anybody in the problems ever had relationships problems like this, but I met this guy and I said, he'd been married for like 50 years or something like that. I said to him, how do you do it? He said, young man, that's how long ago it was. He said, young man, I heard a long time ago, it's more important to be the right person than to find the right person. That was the wisest thing I could have heard. I started working on myself at that time. I went to a psychologist. I went to some group counseling. I did all this stuff, you know. Now, she and I were married, married for two and a half years. It, it was two and a half years of intense hell. I guess that's the right word. And I can't blame her because I picked her. You know, I set myself up for this. What was it about me that made me want to be punished that badly? I, I agree. It. And anyhow, started working on it. And then a few months later, I'm out riding another, I bought another motorcycle by this time, by the way. I've got this job and it's working out real good and I'm making good money. And, and, and I, I go into a 7-Eleven store and I see a girl with the prettiest smile I've ever seen. That's number four, but that comes later. Uh, I uh, ask her out on a date. Well, well, this was a couple of times later. You know, met her at 7-Eleven. It's more than just a convenience store. But, you know... I asked her out about three or four times. I also tell people the first time I met my wife, she gave me a guess, but she didn't like that one. So I'm not going to say it. But uh, I asked her out three or four times, and she kept turning me down one night. One night I finally said to her, what time you get off? And she told me, I said, well, meet me for a cup of coffee. I said, 
Uh, give me a half hour. At the end of a half hour, if you don't like me, you don't have to tell me your last name, your address, where you live, phone number, any of that good stuff. She said, well, what's in it for me? I said, at the end of a half hour, if you don't like me, I'll never ask you out again. She said, okay. So <laughs> anyhow, we've been together. We had a short period of breakup because I was so scared of women at this time. We had been dating about six months, and I liked her so much that I uh, uh, broke up with her, you know, if that makes sense to you, because I was scared at this point. Well, anyhow, we were broke up for about two months, and we got back together. And last April 25th, this young lady and I have been married 31 years. She is... Still the sweetest lady I've ever known. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we've had our share of troubles, so things have not been easy. But when I met her, she had four teenage kids, by the way. And you ever dealt with teenagers, one is enough. But anyhow, we got through this, and, and we stayed together. Uh, in 2014, our son passed away. The... Uh, Autopsy said it was heart, but he was quite the drinker. He drank quarts of, of uh, vodka every day straight, and I'm sure that the alcohol had something to do with it. At that time, I told her, she, she found him, by the way. She was so devastated, I made a promise to her at that time that I would do whatever I could to outlive her because I never wanted to see her hurt that bad again. Uh... But life has different plans for us sometimes. In 2019, our oldest grandson OD'd. <laughs> That's what these are for. You know, I kind of wondered why I wanted to talk tonight at this time. But one year ago, our daughter passed away on this day. She was a beautiful young lady. She ended up, she was choked on uh, some strudel stuff, but she had fentanyl in her system. She wasn't normally a drug user, but fentanyl killed her daughter. We have given, given so many trials in life that it's amazing. My, my one daughter, the one that came to live with me in Alaska, a few years ago, she came down with follicular lymphoma, a form of cancer. Three years ago, they gave her seven months to live. She's still alive today, though, so doctors aren't always right. My other daughter that lived in California, uh, she was mad at me when her mother and I broke up. Did not talk to me for eight years. One day, I got a phone call out of the clear, out of the blue. And uh, she had been dating this guy that was, uh, had an alcohol problem. She called me to ask about alcoholism. And we, am I getting close? We, uh, uh, we got back together from that. Uh, she even named her second son after me. There's a little Charles running around. I hope he don't grow up to be like me. Well, he's not that little anymore. He just graduated from college. With the, with the, up to me, you still that big. But, uh, you know, I love the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. I love the people that I've met in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love uh, the ability to handle the death of our kids. I don't know how I do it. I don't know how their mother did it, but we did it. We've done it together. People were, so, you know, so, uh, the word is not sympathetic, but so nice to me when all this happened. There were people there, Alcoholics Anonymous and the friends of Alcoholics Anonymous, they divide the pain and they increase the joy. That's what everybody has taught me in AA. I didn't used to like people. I didn't used to care for people. I didn't used to realize that other people had feelings and sometimes I hurt them. I try not to do that today. I try and be a nice guy. And I know that my, you know, my wife and my dog loves me. 
If I could be half the man my dog thinks I am, I'd be so wonderful. You know, that, that's, the way that, that's the way that they are. But uh, I want to thank George. I want to thank Curtis and Mike for allowing me to speak tonight. Speaking at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is a privilege. It's not a chore. I was real nervous when I got up here, and I'm still a little bit nervous. But I'm getting better. I was a very introverted little kid. Uh, you know, we were all little kids once. If our, your childhood was kind of rocky, you know, realize that you're in control now of that steering wheel. You're driving that car down the road. And that you're not that little kid anymore. You're a full-grown adult, and you have the ability to change your life for the better, to build a better, happier life, you know. So start by giving yourself the love that you might have been denied. Start by sharing that love with other people. It's amazing what you can do when you have a little bit of love out there. And as my friend, Lucy, who goes, by the way, the, I want to thank everybody who showed up tonight to support me. That's pretty, the, the Tuesday, Thursday, the open big book study is well represented. Uh, my friend Lucy from there, she always closes with this. She said, God loves you. I love you. Keep, keep coming back. <laughs>